Hi everyone and welcome back to part two of this tactical analysis of Greater Firth, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, a look at their 4132 formation. Part one, just to have a little recap, was largely looking at them in possession, the use of the 4132 versus a 352 type of system, how they gain numerical supremacy, how they use positional play to exploit key space, etc. And so I highly recommend if you haven't seen that, watch that video first. This session is going to be looking at uh, Greater Firth from an outer possession perspective. With that, I'm going to break it down into pressing, central block, and defending around the box. But I'm going to also spend a, long, a decent amount of time looking at their counter pressing. I think the counter pressing for a Bundesliga two side is most of the time very, very good. And I think it's interesting. But it's not perfect. And I'm going to be looking at it from quite a critical eye. Here as before, my name is Glenn Preston, I'm a tactical analyst, uh, we're nearing 15,000 subscribers, so it's great work from everybody. Please like, share if the content, if you find it of use, it's only going to cost you one click of your button. The representation, here we can see the shape, 442 diamond, 4312, and you can see the strength in numbers, six players to the central zones, although there is space in the wide areas. Here's a second example where you can see the same shape again. And what's going to be crucial to get this system right is distances of this midfield chain. They've got a lot of distance to cover, so they need mobility. But you can see here again, teams potentially will put a 2v1 on the 10. But they also, if you don't get your distances right and you're too wide, they're going to play straight through the heart of you. So it's a demanding job on that midfield three to cover the horizontal shifts and also be compact enough in order to prevent things like this central penetration. Hi, it's crucial you obtain pitch control. Keep the team into half a pitch. Here's a poor example. Whilst the pressing intensity good is good, he should curve his run when he presses the goalkeeper in order to take out this centre-back that's going to drop and make himself available. He has to get his body between these two players because that's going to force the goalkeeper to play to that side of the pitch, which offers predictability, pitch control. It allows all our players to squeeze up on those players and we know what space that we're trying to protect. Here you can see they're going to be able to play out of pressure here. They no longer have pitch control and they're gonna to have to work much harder cover much greater distances you can see here they're not arriving in time they're late in the presses they're able to pop round and now it's very easy for them to break the press and get into the final third Here's a better pressing example. You can see the striker here just about curves his run enough to take out this centre back and force the goalkeeper to one side. Again, it allows predictability. They nearly steal it and win it off the goalkeeper's poor distribution. But here's the strengths and the weaknesses all in one. Because look at the numbers you can get essentially. Absolutely fantastic. But here's one of the problems. A diamond shape, in my opinion, is easy to play through passing lanes. It offers two passing lanes and opportunities to get two V1s and be able to outplay four players quite easily so it's good in terms of like i say you can see here really good compact lines good central presence wouldn't be happy about the distances that are starting to emerge from this fullback i'd want my fullback to stay tucked in a little bit later than what he does here because i think it's too easy to offer this running behind he can't get good pressure on the ball so it allows for an easy pass either in behind or to break that back line but you can see here again look switching the play your midfield three has been taken out again and they can't get pressure on areas like that Trying to press high, a double pivot, creating a 2v1 on the 10 here, and again they can break the press. So there's definitely vulnerabilities and weaknesses within this system. Here you can see again, good central presence in terms of three players. The numbers are through the centre of the pitch are strong, but there are these little openings and little gaps that I think is the vulnerability. Now you have this in a 4-3-3, but you have wide players and wingers that can also tuck in and, and help with these little pockets of space. Here your fullbacks are going to have to do it, and it's going to take them out like in this moment, and not, uh, you know, a side with good clever combination play might just pop round you. I'll just show one more example. The strength in terms of defending key space centrally, you can see four bodies, but again they can get taken out quite easily in these little pockets down the side if the balance isn't right.
So in this last section, I'm going to evaluate their counter pressing. And within this, I'm going to look at um, structures in place and the principles that allow them to execute success. It's not always successful, so we'll look at one or two examples where it goes wrong. But the vast majority of the time, this is a strength of their play. So as we're looking at the footage now, you can see there's numerical equality here in close proximity to the ball. A key principle of counter pressing, you've got to have at least numerical equality generally, and you need to have players that are close to play. They've just lost the ball on the edge of the box. They're in a reasonably good situation here. They've got three players, 3v3. They need to get pressure on the ball in less than three seconds. This is the player that's going to get on the ball, and they've also got to apply pressure from where he wants to attack towards, which is in these areas here, the spare player here. So this player's got to press from the side and cut out his main free playing option, whilst the others close in on the ball. Equally, we need that structure behind the ball to stop him playing vertically, and that's what we get. And just here a really clever movement across his line of play he prevents him from playing forwards and he moves him towards the touch line where they then have pitch control stance here you can see where does he want to attack that direction so when he structures behind the ball and the two white players have got to close in and try and prevent verticality but also they need a, like I say, a player behind that's going to prevent him playing forwards. And as you see here, there's your player blocking the vertical pass. And there's your two versus one on the ball. They've won it back inside two to three seconds. They've got to get pressure on him in another two, three seconds. We can achieve that. Okay, so he's got to stop him playing forwards. And there you go. They force the play out wide where they can now get a 2v1 on the ball and stop any inside passing lane. So they have pitch control because they're forced long into a favourable 2v1 situation or they're playing into that channel. Here's a good one because here they don't have control of this situation initially. So here's where they've got to recognise where they cannot counter press and they have to go into more delay mode. And this player just blocks his line of vision, blocks his vertical pass, allowing the other players to cover around the back of him so that they can protect the areas they want to attack. The aspects that intrigued me about this system, with it being so many players between the lines um, supporting the strikers, was would they be able to play direct and still be an efficient, effective counter-pressing team? Because everybody kind of knows today that in order to be really successful with counter-pressing, you need to play short, you need to keep players in close proximity, move up the pitch together so that you've got good structures to press once you lose it. But you can see here, three at the back, one holding midfielder. There's not a lot of players to play through, so they're going to be forced long quite a lot of the time. So I wanted to see whether I thought it was favourable or a disadvantage in this system, because straight from the off here, you can see the space between the lines. But it isn't. They're clever. I think they're aware of this. You'll see this player here drops behind the line of the ball. Again, that essential pillar that you need to counter press. One player to stand right in behind the line of the ball and then everybody else squeezes up really quickly. And you can see what was 20 yards of space has turned into a three versus one in their favour. That was an interesting one because having uh, listened to Steve Sternick quite a lot, he talks about having... You know, not just numerical equality, but numerical supremacy and keeping to that side that has supremacy for advantages of counter pressing, which is obvious number wise. It's 3v3 here, but with the numbers behind the ball, they've probably got superiority. So when switching the play here, the question becomes, do they really have a good situation? Now, they probably do if they can make use of this 2v1 or this player that's about to receive is really good in 1v1s. But you can see they're going to concede their ability to counter press. Yes, there's bodies flying in but they don't have players close to the ball. They don't have numerical equality. If this pass was good, they would have escaped the press. Just in food for thought there to think about, about your attacking situation if you want to be a counter press inside when you're switching the play. And the last thing from me really is, is that the kind of pressing system you think complements your, your players? If not, there are other formations this naturally falls into. So Barnsley, for example, have a tendency to have more wide strikers. They can sort of transition from this formation into a 4-3-3 if the circumstance sort of dictates. It can fall back into a 4-4-2. So if it isn't the right pressing system for you, then there are other solutions for you to explore. This session up here are some key points from the analysis session. I'm not going to go through them because I've talked enough. You can pause the video and go through if you need to. Equally, there's some other analysis. There are links in the description. Some other videos I've made on Liverpool. Some analysis I was asked to do on England on the 20s. Once again, thank you very much for watching. Give it a like. Give it a subscribe. I really do appreciate your support.